Let's talk about pattern recognition. Humans are naturally wired in order to recognize patterns pretty easily. It's part of the reason we've existed for so long. In fact, we're so good at pattern recognition that we begin to see patterns where, scientifically, there are none. For example, you can see similarities between groups of people on factors they can't exactly control and say they're all alike because of patterns that you've noticed. Like, for example, I've noticed patterns between different types of fighting game players. Oh my god, it's the thing that the video's about! I've made a video similar to this about character stereotypes in Guilty Gear Strive. But of course, being a YouTuber, I wanted to do more. Go bigger! Get sillier! And I decided that instead of just doing the casual thing and picking a different popular game, which I will definitely be doing in the future, so don't use this clip against me when that happens, I should blow the lid off this whole thing and target the community at large. Now for the disclaimers, this is all just a bit of fun and in no way is meant to belittle or insult anyone. Please do not use the terms in this video seriously or use them to insult anyone. There's also a good chance that you don't fit neatly into any one term, because they're all made up. So it might happen that you're part of one term and also part of another. You are human, hopefully. So trying to fit you neatly into any one category would be hard. That being said though, you are definitely somewhere on this list and I'm 100% right about this all of the time. So without further ado, let's begin where every good story starts. The beginning. Ah, the baby. A being so pure, so innocent, uncorrupted by life, so full of hope and optimism. They have the entire world laid out before them, with no past baggage to weigh them down. They are a blank canvas, with nothing but the future to look forward to. Who knows where they will be months from now? The baby is representative of the newbies of fighting games. When people first try out these games, they're amazed by every little accomplishment they manage to achieve. Every motion input, every free hit combo, everything that more experienced players take for granted, the baby will absolutely find amazing. That's weird, I attacked them, but their move beat mine. That that doesn't make any sense. Oh yeah, mate, you got DP'd. DP'd? I thought this was a T-rated game. No, you got dragon punched. It's, uh, it's an invincible reversal. Wait! There's moves that are invincible? Oh, you poor sweet summer child. Through the baby, we can relive the moments we felt. The absolute joy of landing a wake-up super. The hype of clutching a close set. The chaos of bringing back a spaghetti round. We can feel it all again vicariously through them. Now, the community is somewhat split on how we should treat the little newbies. Some people believe it's our job to cuddle them and make sure that they have the best time they can. To safely and politely teach them the basics of these games and lead them down the path of improvement one fight at a time. We should cheer them on when they're playing, celebrate every small victory with them, and coddle them whenever they lose. Oh, it's okay, sweetie. Axel's bullshit anyway. Don't worry about it. It is our job to make sure their transition into a trusted member of our community is as smooth as possible. Alternatively, we could give them the real fighting game experience. Welcome to the FGC, bitch. Now, the baby will not remain a baby for long. It is the starting point of their evolution, and as they get stronger and stronger, the baby will become more and more confident. But if they get a bit too confident, they could develop an... overwhelming ego. But first, a word from our partner. For any of you who've been around for a while, you may know that I'm somewhat of a soda enthusiast, a pop enjoyer, a fizzy drink fanatic. I take my fizzy drinks very seriously. It's the main thing I drink on a daily basis, and that's why my doctor hates me. But there's always a type of fizzy drink I've been unable to stomach well, and that is energy drinks. Every time I have an energy drink, I always get a good boost of energy, followed by a ridiculously hard crash that just kills me for the rest of the day. If only I could have an energy drink that didn't cause me to get hit with a raging demon after I finished it. Well, I'm in luck, because ladies, gentlemen, and those who float in the spaces between, I am proud to introduce you to Rogue Energy, a new partner of the Gecko Scroll channel. Rogue is a power 
powdered energy drink substitute that delivers you a boost of energy without having you crash after the caffeine wears off. This is because of science and chemistry and magical wizard stuff that my small bike and brain cannot understand, but I have tried it and I can tell you that it does actually work, at least for me. They have a bunch of different high quality flavors like sour candy, pink lemonade, black cherry, and my personal favorite, blood orange, which tastes so good, I cannot express how much I love this one. Simply get some regular or sparkling water, add a scoop of the powder, make sure to mix it up, maybe add some ice, and boom, you have a delicious caffeinated drink. But Gecko, I can't have caffeine. Well, that sucks for you, but don't worry because they have non-caffeinated versions of their drinks which all have their own flavors like dragon fruit mango, raspberry peach, and the mysterious moon dust which is going away very soon and that kind of makes me upset because I want to know what the moon tastes like. They got shakers, they got cool looking merch, they got canned versions of their drinks for the Yanks out there. And they've got a great deal for all of you today. For the next three days, if you use the code he's getting at checkout, you get 30% off your order, so you can get these extremely tasty drinks at a heavily reduced price. Not sure if you want some? Well, they have free samples where you can get three different flavor packets for no cost at all. So if you want to go, you can try those free samples and come back. But the code will have worn off by then. <laughs> you silly bugger. If you're seeing this after the 28th of March 2023, then don't worry, because he's getting will still give you a 20% discount. So you you still get an absolute killer deal. Thank you, Rogue, for the partnership. I greatly appreciate it, and I hope you guys are excited to see more of them in the future. Now, back to the video. The Ego Maniac, or the Ego for short, is a player who believes that they're absolutely the best at every fighting game. They are, without a doubt, the strongest player in every game they've ever touched. All games that are blessed with their presence should bask in their glory as they have decided to bless this lowly game with their golden touch. Bow before me, mortals, for I am the one true god! <laughs> Well now, obviously, this person is a little bit up their own ass, and some of you may be saying, Oh, well, Gecko, someone who talks like this must have the skill to back it up. I mean, no one proclaims themselves as the false god, thus damning themselves to eternal punishment. Without being the best player in the world, that would just be foolish. And while I'm not a religious man, I would probably say that you're right. Apart from the fact that you're wrong. While there are definitely top players who talk and act like this, it isn't exclusive to top tier players who actually have some credentials to back up their claims on how good they are. This is simply anyone who believes that they are, in fact, the best at what they do. This is the kind of person who sees someone doing something hard and believes, I can do that 100% of the time without prior training, and never actually test that fact until they get into a real match and realize, oh shit, this is way harder than it looks. They're also the kind of people who just can't help themselves from backseat gaming. You know when you're like watching a tournament set and there's that one guy who's like, you know, I think the choice to spend the meter there and break the wall was an okay decision, but personally, I would have just done a jump cancel from a 5k into an elaborate wall combo using the meter to extend my combo with a downwards gun explosion so I could then get more damage and wall pressure, thus leading to a more guaranteed kill, but you know, that's just me. Now some of you might be hearing this and think that this dude's toxic, and while it can somewhat be toxic to criticize someone's play when they didn't exactly ask you to, especially while they're playing a set, see Twitch chat, they're not actually out to be toxic or belittle other people. A lot of the things that they say are rude in some regard, and being told your community is just bad at games can be very toxic, but it generally comes from a place of self-obsession rather than hatred. Not to mention you can generally shut these guys up pretty easily, if you beat them there's a chance that they throw a bit of a temper tantrum, but they will respect the person who beat them and be civil about things. Though they were still right, and it's important to them that you know that they were still right. If they critique someone else's play, it's fair game. They're allowed to do that because they're the best. The GOAT. The Alpha. But if you were to point out something they did wrong, um, actually, that was the optimal sequence there because the wind was blowing in north northeast at 0.2 mots and the moon was waxing last night while Mercury was in your mom, so it made my cotton blow optimal. Unless they ask you for feedback on their play, they won't actually accept anything you tell them. They very much have a find it out yourself kind of mentality. Good for learning some things, really bad when you start to plateau. It also kind of applies to the way that they try and teach new players. If they're playing with someone who's new to the game, well, tough shit, buddy. You 
you're going to learn through osmosis or trial by error. Have you ever had that friend that would tell you how to deal with the thing that they've been spamming? And then when you actually go to deal with the thing that they've been spamming, they do the thing to counter the option you just told them? Yeah, that's this guy. Them being right about everything also extends to character strength. If you disagree with their tier list, it's not a, oh, well, I guess we just have different perspectives. Nah, they straight up killing you on site next chance they get. If you do not put pot in at least fucking mid tier, it's on site. I swear to God. Having an ego is fine. Good even. Believing in yourself and pushing your abilities is always a good thing to do, but you have to make sure that you keep it in check. You're human, and there's only so much you can get away with. And if you don't keep it in check, then our old friend might come out to play. Now here's a term we're all familiar with. The scrub is a mentality that is unfortunately commonly adopted in a bunch of competitive games and not just fighting games. The scrub is the mentality in which if anything bad happens, it isn't their fault and it's simply someone else's fault or there was something wrong with the game. The scrub is quick to anger, has violent outbursts, is extremely rude and hurtful to others around them, and always manages to find a way to dodge accountability for their actions. I'm also co-opting the phrase the gamer, extremely derogatory because it's funny. Now, the scrub does actually have a large overlap with the ego. However, they aren't the same thing. If they had a Venn diagram, I would say it looks something like this. It's basically the same, but there's that small gap on either side, which means I win and I get to talk about this for another three to five minutes. This is generally because if you believe that you're better than everyone else, then you must always be right. So if you lose, however you lost, couldn't have been your fault. Your controller must have been broken. No, that works fine. Well, the other guy must have been playing dishonorably. That's a show though, bud. They're the most honest types of characters in these games. Well, it doesn't really take skill to play a show though. I mean, if you want to go and try and play them, go for it, mate. But some of those links are actually really fucking hard. Well, obviously, they only care about winning. And that's the Scrub Lord's Prayer, baby. Thank you, Corey Gaming. Nothing that happens can be their fault. And because of that, when they do lose, they always find a way out of it. In other games, this is normally by blaming their teammates for not pulling their weight, or maybe blaming the RNG of the game for not giving them the tools that they needed in order to win. But for fighting games, a genre in which there are zero teammates and very little luck factor, with some notable exceptions, finding something to blame becomes much harder. Lag is generally the one that's cited very quickly, but after that, it can either go to the balance of the game, or to you. The biggest distinction between the scrub and the egomaniac is that the scrub will go for the other player they're playing against, and they won't let up. They will not only attack your skill as a player, there's a chance they'll attack you as an individual. I will now do a dramatic reading of some common scrub quotes. You and everyone who plays your character is ass. Stop spamming that broken fucking move, I swear to god. If I see that character, it's dodge on sight. Just straight up bigotry. And, of course, game end yourself. Thank you for coming to the Scrub Quotes Dramatic Reading, and if you have any experiences with issues like this, then yeah, same dude, I don't know how to deal with it or stop it, honestly. Since a lot of Scrubs also think that they're the new god of fighting games, it's common to see them taunting higher level players in order to try and prove themselves. It once again doesn't actually matter how good they are, and the results for winning and losing are basically the same, as they will tear into their opponent with insults on their gameplay and themselves at every opportunity. Never money match one of these guys, because they will not pay up at all unless you somehow get them into a binding contract where you can sue them for not paying you'll never see that money and just be left feeling sad about what happened now it's easy to see the scrub as somewhat of a buggy man something that is always lurking around every corner but you can never actually fully see it no matter how hard you try. But trust me, scrubs are 100% real, and I've seen them. I've even interacted with a few, unfortunately. Now, there is a good chance that someone's seen like a scrub, but they're actually just really having a bad day, week, month, year, life, and you just so happen to be in their crosshairs on that day. But for the people who just rage at every opportunity, for those who feel intense anger when they lose and nothing when they win, and need to find ways to take it out on other people, it might be worth taking a break, doing something else, getting help. Hell, even just actually touching grass might help. When was the last time you opened your window? Seriously. If you're not enjoying what you're doing, then why do it at all? I get the passion to want to be seen as good at something can be a powerful driving force, but there's no use striving for that if it affects your enjoyment and the enjoyment of others. If you feel called out by this, maybe take a look in the mirror and figure out what it is you truly want. Also, Try just being nice to people. It's completely free and it'll get you way more friends. Hell, you could even get some tips from the next guy on the list.
The Chill is the stone cold icy killer of the FGC. Their mentality, untouchable. Their emotions, unreadable. Their will, unbreakable. Their pop-offs, tame. These players are seen as the zen masters of fighting games. No matter how much pressure they're being put under, be it in situations they're in, their opponents pressure both in and out of the game, and even situations outside of these games. Every situation they find themselves in life, they treat it exactly the same, and it can make them extremely unpredictable. You could throw them into a five-star kitchen on Valentine's Day and force them to make the most complex meal you could ever devise, and they would show the same amount of stress as making popcorn for the Family Guy Funny Moments binge session. And that is isn't to say that they would fuck it up, they get it done, they make the best meal that you could ever imagine, and it would look like they barely even stressed out about it, and it's quite frankly amazing. This ironclad mental also means they question themselves very little. Now you may be going, hey, wait a minute, isn't this just the ego? But it's more of a different way of getting to a similar result. While the ego player believes that they do nothing wrong because they're the best, the chill player will acknowledge that they've made mistakes in the match, but thinking about it during the set is meaningless and then dismiss it. This can also be seen with stronger players who have multiple characters. If you play more than one character and you lose, it can sometimes be tempting to switch to your other character in an attempt to secure a win. Now this can sometimes be very effective, especially if you're playing into a matchup that you're not very comfortable with, but there's always the chance of the thought of I should switch or I shouldn't have switched can bring down your performance. The chill will choose one of these options and simply accept that they made that option and play without the other thought in their mind. This can come back to bite them sometimes, unless they're extremely diligent and go back through their VODs after matches and take notes, there's a good chance that they just kind of forget what happened after the match is over. You can turn to them and ask what they were doing during a specific interaction and they just stare at you like... I have no idea what's going on, dude. This isn't exactly unique to them either, but if they're not dedicated to improving, it can take them a very, very long time to figure out what they're doing wrong. As long as the ego? Eh, probably not, but still longer than the average competitive player does. Their ironclad mentality also means that you don't gotta worry about them beating themselves up over their results. There's some types of players that will lose and immediately head towards a depressive spiral, but these guys will take the losses on the chin and move past them. They'll also probably cheer on the person who beat them and will absolutely help their homies through the problems that they were facing in the brackets. Just don't expect any massive cheers from them. Generally, chill players fit into one or two categories. There are the absolute zen, almost monk-like players who are able to just brush aside any worries or stress that they have and find a solution to the problems easily. And then there's the others who, uh, use other methods to enter their zen state. Look, I'm not accusing anyone of getting high and having that affect their mental health, but when you walk through some of the hotel rooms at these events, you can definitely tell which halls have the chill players in them. If it wasn't for the smell though, there's a good chance that you wouldn't be able to tell which category of players these belong to. Chill players are just able to keep themselves in the zone and not stress themselves out about anything. By not stressing themselves out, they're able to focus on the game like no other players are, and it can lead to absolutely hype moments. It's just a shame they're not the ones popping off. But do you know who is though? Now this one should sound familiar to a lot of you. The term weeb means someone who is not Japanese, that is obsessed with Japanese culture, and wishes that they were Japanese. And by Japanese culture, most people generally mean anime and manga, along with Japanese video games. Weebs are sometimes known to be pretty cringe when it comes to, um, everything. But in fighting games, they're honestly not too out of place. You'll always find these guys playing fighting games with anime aesthetics, a subgenre which we literally just call anime games at this point. So if you're into Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat, then congratulations, you don't have to interact with them as much. But trust me, they're always there. Now, like every one of these stereotypes, there's generally a scale of how extreme the stereotype is. So you could have a small ego player who's not too brash, but definitely up their own ass, and they'd still be classed as an ego player. The weeb scale very much exists, and it's the easiest one to understand. You can tell how much of a weeb someone is by their main game. If you have somebody who likes Dragon Ball Fighters, they're probably a pretty mild weeb. They'll mimic the Kamehameha, maybe they'll say some of their characters' voice lines when they're doing supers, have a cap with Dragon Ball on it, but apart from that, they're basically just the average person. And then, on the other end of the scale, you have Melibud players who do not ask a Dark Apostle Noel player their thoughts on the Japanese Age of Consent law changes. No matter where they land on this scale, there's generally some things 
themes that all weebs have that define them. To begin with, weebs constantly have an internal monologue going on, like they're the protagonist of an anime. Every hit they take always results in something like, what, Nani? There's no way that I got hit by that! Their overhead came out so fast, I could barely see it coming. Is this the true power of the TK Yosan Sen? No, I mustn't falter now. It's gonna hurt a lot, but I still have some fight left in me. As long as I can wait for my opening, Yes! There it is! They'll never see this one coming now! Try to block this one! Volcanic Viper! No way! Because of this internal monologue, they're the most likely type of players to self-deprecate after they lose, even if it's in casual. There's a good chance that if they lose enough, they'll go into a depression arc that could last several months. They'll never actually quit because, you know, part of anime is never giving up and all that crap, but they'll make it seem like you're never going to see them again, only to come back several months later, basically unchanged. They also tend to, uh, overhype everything that happens. They see a free frame button connect and begin to go on a full Bedman style monologue about the consequences of this action and how it will affect the rest of the match. How the read and prediction of the move was so perfect and so precise, and how only a genius level player would ever be able to actually do do something like that. When in reality, the dude on the stage just looked at the mental stack and said, eh, fuck it, and called that bluff on the safe jump. They also tend to do this shit when trying to help other players learn the game. You ask them a question like, hey dude, how can I block Angie's H follow-up? And they'll respond with something like, ah, of course, the H Fujin follow-up. One of Angie's riskiest tools, but also one of his most rewarding. Angie's Fujin follow-ups can be pretty linear with all of them being beaten with simple reactions. While you could deal with most follow-ups by blocking low, uh, this one is different, very different. You have to stand block in order to block it. When you could have just said, oh yeah, it's an overhead. Block it standing. This type of vocabulary can actually be a benefit to them. Well, sometimes. It's not uncommon for fighting game players to retell their experiences with sets and matches to other players, with it being the intent to help them with matchup devices or just share stories. The weeb in this regard could actually be the most engrossing and interesting to listen to when they retell their stories because of how much they dramatize everything. Since they make every interaction sound like a clashing of the gods, it makes for the stories that they tell to be really entertaining. You can definitely see and feel the arrogance coming off of them as they describe themselves as the protagonist of their own an anime where the battles are set in a fighting game, but it's nice to just listen to them sometimes. If you give one of these guys an audience, they might even make an entire series dedicated to their journey of playing tournaments in a vain attempt to make their admittedly mediocre runs sound like the most intense things you've ever seen. And you should go and watch it! Now you do need to be a bit of a nerd in order to play these games and take them seriously anyway. No matter how much you deny it, you're a nerd if you take fighting games seriously. So is this everyone in the community? No, of course it's not. These are the kind of people that just radiate the nerd emoji energy whenever they open their mouth. The- knows basically everything there is to know about that given game. This ranges from useful things like the properties and frame data of every move in the game and setups for every character, with ways to counterplay those setups, to more obscure things like measurements of every character. And the one time the writers forgot about Scrimblow Blimblow's backstory in the 2008 version of the third game, leading to an extremely world-shattering inconsistency in the lore of the current game. There are actually a lot of benefits to having endless fountains of knowledge about a given game game. Since they know basically everything, they're extremely good at tutoring and mentoring players who need a little bit of help in departments. They're also able to break down matches really easily, so having them on hand for a VOD review can help you find flaws in your game plan and even maybe adjusting your whole game plan to more appropriately utilize your character or match your playstyle better. Just be careful when asking them questions because sometimes they'll go overboard with explaining it. Hey, how do I deal with Angie's hate fusion follow-up? Oh, it's a negative nine on block overhead. If you block it standing, you can basically get any punish you want. You play biking, right? Obviously the most optimal response to the overhead is to just do a close slash so you can begin your safe jump pressure, and that of course leads to your entire game plan. But there can be some problems with this. And let's say that you have to FD in order to not get chipped out by the food you follow. You do know that holding FD means that you can't get chipped out, right? Okay, good, I need to make sure, because you can be a bit aloof sometimes, you know? Well, if you do that, then this actually puts you too far away for you to get a close slash to connect. Your fast slash and heavy slash don't really work in those situations. In those situations, I would love to go for a 5k. It's 5 frames, it goes far enough to actually connect with him, so you can convert into a safe jump or even go for a reset Yosan Sen situation. Of course, you do need to delay the Yosan Sen, otherwise it combos from the 5k, so you get an extremely suboptimal combo. At that point, you might as well have just gone into a 5k, 6k Tatami, and then you get a safe jump setup, or you can use a bit of Micho to get a Kamari knockdown, which 
can lead to a whole heap of situations that are advantageous to you. You sometimes need to give them a sign that they should just shut up a little bit, because if you don't, they will go on for hours. Or maybe, you know, you just like hearing them talk. Who knows? There's only really one massive downside to this kind of player, and that's the fact that they spend so much time in the lab, they generally have no idea how to actually play with opponents. They got no neutral, no footsies, all sauce, no base, the worst pizza you've ever eaten. Who the f- Fuck, serve me this. It's disgusting. They know how to do optimal combos and optimal setups, but they go up against Jeremy Baromi 226, who's just shimmying them like crazy, and they absolutely crumble. They might even get pissed off at other players playing their character suboptimally and it just working without them realizing that sometimes suboptimal is actually optimal. I'm not elaborating on this point, that's a video for another time. They're just little lab rats that test every interaction they can in order to find ridiculous setups and situations that might never actually come to fruition. And then at 4pm when you're just finishing work, you get a DM from them on Discord of a sick new combo they found. And when you ask when they woke up today, they just say, so you wanna play when you get back home? But they are extremely valuable, with the best being able to discover completely new tech and redefine complex characters over and over to create extremely optimal and hard to deal with combos and pressure, especially if they're not sharing the secrets on how their character works. So what happens when you mix the best part of all these players? What happens if you get all of the good and not much of the bad? Well, that's when you get something truly terrifying. This is a category that only a select few players from every game can claim to have achieved. The living legend is defined by one thing above everything else. One thing that no other category has claimed to. Pure. Perfect. Power. The living legend somehow manages to be the culmination of the best parts of other categories and discards any weaknesses that may come from them. They are calm in the most tense of situations. They have extensive and endless knowledge of their given game, or games, and still manage to be unpredictable and innovative. And most importantly, they have a knack for winning in every game that they enter. Living legends are rare, and the likelihood is just by hearing the term, some players have already come to your mind. Daigo Umahara, Justin Wong, Ni, Ogawa, Goichi, Sonic Fox. Hearing these names and others like it can be enough to make some players cower in fear, or to make the Reckless rise up and face them, believing they have a solid chance of winning. But there's a reason why legends in the FGC are made and not born, and there's seemingly an infinite gap between your average player and the legend that stands before you. They can deal with players easily. Even ones close to their skill will have an extremely hard time taking them down. Some players will have to do nothing but prep, just to fight them in case they're going to clash in a tournament run. But what happens when two legends collide? Well, when you get an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object, that's when history is made. This category is hard to define, because the only thing that links legends is their dominance in any game. No two legends are exactly alike. Some of them are calm, cold, calculating. Perhaps they slow the game down to a crawl in order to try and break their opponent's will and have them open themselves up for a counterattack. Some of them are aggressive and hot-headed. They know they're the best and will take any challenge that comes their way in order to show others just how good they really are. Some of them know so much about the game, you wouldn't even think that they were human, they were some sort of machine. And some of them just do things that don't make any sense, but it works out. But most importantly, living legends are just like you and are just like me. All of these legends at the end of the day are just people with their own lives and experiences. Being good at a video game, or multiple video games in some cases, doesn't make you some ascended being that's above everybody else who touches the game. It just means that you've got sauce and you know how to use it. At the end of the day, every pro player is just some person that really likes fighting games and managed to get good enough to be able to beat most players. Legends just take that one step further and create history by beating countless people consistently. Anyone can become a living legend. Even you, if you try hard enough. That basically wraps things up, but there is one type of player that I haven't been able to talk about yet. 
and hopefully they're someone extremely familiar to you. This is Greg. More specifically, their full name is your mate Greg. Greg is generally good at most video games they play, and maybe they have one game that they play more than anything else, but in general, they play lots of different games. Shooters, MOBAs, racers, RTS games, card games, and sometimes they even play fighting games. And like most of the things that Greg plays, Greg is pretty good at fighting games. At least they might be better than you and maybe even most of the people that you know. But Greg doesn't exactly have a competitive drive. Greg's just there to hang out with friends and have a good time. They'll laugh at the funny intro cutscenes and the weird situations that happen in matches. They'll bounce between characters to try and find different things out and mix it up. And they'll do very friendly trash talking when things get a bit intense. But after a while, they'll move on to the next big thing. You probably know Greg. They probably go by a different name and maybe there's even multiple Gregs, but Greg is the reason that a lot of people have gotten into these games in the first place. They managed to make every fighting game you play with them enjoyable and fun, and they might even ignite the fire of competition in your heart. But let's be honest, Greg's not gonna go pro. They don't want to. They're never gonna grind ranked or go for any crazy item in the game because they just don't want to. Greg has the same goal that most players have when playing any video game. They just want to have a good time. If you ask me, playing with people like Greg is the most optimal experience that you can have in fighting games. Hell, it's the most optimal experience you can have in any game at all. When your goal becomes having fun and enjoying yourself, you tend to have a better experience with people and learn to love these games, even if it's only casually. Hell, maybe you are Greg and you've stumbled onto this video. And if you are the Greg of a friend group, I just need to say this. Thank you. At the end of the day, we all started playing these games for one reason. We enjoy them. This can be in a casual or competitive sense, but there's something about fighting games that ignites a fire in us as a community, and they hold a special place in our hearts because of that. While it's fun to meme on people for the habits that they have and the silly things that they do, and then try and group them into types of people based on very common habits, we're all here because someone showed us how cool these games can be, and we enjoy playing them with other people. At the end of the day, having fun with everyone is all that matters, right? Thank you for watching. I'm live right now on Twitch, so if you want to come over and discuss the types of players, or just play me in Strive, then come over, it'd be great to see you. I hope I didn't insult anyone with this video, it was all supposed to be a bit of fun, and these things are obviously never set in stone. There's also a good chance that I actually missed a few types of people. Right now, at the end of the scripts I'm recording this, I can think of a few small other ones that I wasn't able to actually put in. So if you have any ideas on a group that I missed, maybe leave them in the comments, I'd love to see them. I'll hopefully see you on the stream, and if I don't see you there, well, there's always next week. As always, a very special thanks to 64 Megahertz, Almost Nap Time, Brudekai, Daniel Wiederich, Dragon Prox, Games.png, I Am Now Toe, Lady Dantelon, Melodically Me, Monax, N. Hoa, Ray W, Super, Tom Tanks, William Gagnon, and Zandatsu for being tier 2 Patreon supporters.